Very welcome. Thank you so much for being with us, us once again. Uh, all cinephiles around the world, when we got to know about Karina Inus, a Brazilian filmmaker, we got immediately impressed by the film he did at the beginning of this century, which is Madame Sata. But it was a strange. Why a Brazilian filmmaker has that name, Karina Inus? It doesn't sound Brazilian. Well, this is the film that we learned why he is the one who is. Uh, my first question, uh, my extremely admired Mr. Karina Inus, is why you have chosen a kind of path that you have taken before in a film which I think it's outstanding, Viajo porque preciso, vuelvo porque te amo, which is a film that is again, uh, a kind of letter. This is a personal letter, it's a letter to your mother. And I, my first question, why you have chosen these poetics, this way of doing this film, a love letter to your mother, but your mother is not anymore with us, it's a ghost. Why you have chosen that path? I think the correspondence genre film, if you can call it that, but the, the sort of epistolary tradition, where you write a letter to someone um, and the film is sort of a diary, it allows you to um, somehow enter um, sort of the terrain of intimacy that I think it's really beautiful. It's almost like reading a novel that was not supposed to be published in a way. There's a sense of disclosure of an intimate relationship that letters allow you to have that I think is, um, is very powerful. Um, it's kind of my first relationship to film was always film as a diary as well. So I think that also has sort of a dialogue with the diary. Um, so the film diary, which I think it's something that I am, I'm very fond of and I, am, I was very influenced by when I began to make films. Um, and, um, but I think that on the case here, it's really using the diary film, using the, the sort of Bildungsroman or the Roman Clé or this, um, you know, these films that are somehow supposed to be kept and not shown. They're supposed to be kept in a drawer, you know, somewhere secret and not shown. I thought it was just the best, mm -hmm. it was probably the best strategy to talk about really what I think the film is about at the end of the day, which is about colonialism and the consequences of post-colonial, um, you know, post-colonial, post-colonial world really. And so, um, for me, it was really like in Viajo, I think what we did was to use um, the correspondence genre or the, the film with a letter as a letter to someone, as a way to talk about a region in Brazil that had been abandoned, that had been left behind, that had never entered industrialization. So it was always a strategy, either here or in Viajo, um, to use the diary, to use the letters, to use you know the correspondence with someone to actually talk about something um, which is behind that, you know, and on the case of Mary Not the Mountains, it's really about, you know, the consequences of colonialism um, in my life, in my private life, in the world, in the history of Algeria. Um, so um, it just seemed to me as a kind of a political strategy to write history, not with a capital H, but with a, with a small H. I see. There is an outstanding moment in your film when you find someone else who has the same name and almost your same age. So the whole film is about identity. You go to Argelia in order to understand your identity. And then you find someone who is almost a Doppelendanger or a double. So I think behind that there's an idea, which is the relationship between identity and montage or editing. It's not only um, uh, editing, editing a film, it's also editing your, uh, your own identity. How do you see that? Do you think it's worthwhile to think in that way? Identity and montage together? I think on this case, it's very interesting. It's a good question for me to think about because I've always, we've spent about two years editing this film and it's interesting because there was a moment in the beginning of the editing that the film somehow was very linear um, in, in, in the way it dealt with time, in the way it dealt with um, storytelling. 
And um, it became very clear after the first or second cut that this was not what this film, this is not the sort of body that this film should have. And, and, and without really asking myself why, we sort of entered the process of montage, which was very much about memory and it was about mixing uh, memory and present it was a present present it was about sort of a dreamscape it was it was about drifting and i think um the reason i say it's an interesting question is because it really is also about a way of s sort of constructing your own identity it's sort of a, you know the this film is also a bit of a mirror mm -hmm. of myself of the author of the film and so I think that um, it was very interesting how we got to a place in the montage and the editing of the film where the sense of hybridity, the sense of, you know, non-linearity, the sense of um, a not very, um, how would I say, self-conscious way of um, telling a story was um, what seemed appropriate. And it's also, I guess, one could say that it is also somehow a mirror of my own identity, which is an identity that's very mixed and it was very um, broken down in many different ways. And um, so I think that there is certainly, it's interesting when the, the, the shape and the form of, of a film somehow ends up translating you know, what it should be about. Um, so I think, yes, I think that there is a certain, you know, mirror relationship between my identity and the and the way the film was constructed. Yeah, it is interesting that you have, it's such a personal film, but we never seen you in the, in, the, in the shots. We heard you, but we don't see you. Why you have chosen the position to be off screen, not to be in front of the camera, only behind? This is a big decision, why? I made that decision because I had done that before on another movie, um, which had a kind of a similar structure as this one, the one I mentioned on the first question, called I Travel Because I Have To, I Come Back Because I Love You. And um, it was very interesting, at the moment that, you, that you're not present, that the film is narrated in a first person um, sort of situation like, like this one. I think at the moment that you don't see the narrator, it's much easier for the spectator to somehow identify and, and follow the narrative because you sort of become the narrator of the film and I think you appropriate yourself as a viewer a much more, you know, you appropriate the story much more, you sort of inhabit the film much more. So um, at the same time, there are two or three moments that you can sort of see me or see, you know, part of me or like a reflection in the mirror or something like that, you know, that it doesn't feel so abstract as if you're just like a disembodied voice. But I think it's a really interesting moment um, when a film allows the viewer to somehow inhabit the protagonist and not, and not only see the protagonist. And I think that's one of the beauties of these first person films which are narrated. Um, it was interesting because when we made A Travel Because I Have To, you know, many years ago, about 15 years ago, I was very worried about the fact that, that the, the, the sort of character, the main character, was not present. In that case, it was a fictional character. Mm. Um, but as we got feedback from people that had seen the film, it seemed much more, it, it seemed really um, a strong sort of um, decision to not see who is narrating. Therefore, people would come to us and say, oh, that, it was, that was my story and there was something that, you know, I've been through. So I think it's it's a much more open way of um, entering a story, of identifying with the character, of sort of, you know, inhabiting the story um, if, you, um, if you're not present visually. Um, so that's why I decided to do it this way, because of previous experience and because of the fact that it seemed that um, it really worked, uh, the other film. It is quite evident in the film that the political uh, background sometimes emerge. And in this case is the Argelia independent world. And that it's something which is connected with your patent history. So how do you see that in the film? Because it seems to me that you have chosen to keep in the background, never to put it in front of the whole story. And I would like to see how do you see that dialectics and at the same time, this position to be working as that background, such as a background. I think this question um, has to do a lot with the first question that I've answered. 
I think for me, ultimately, this is a movie somehow I needed to make. Um, but beyond that, my biggest challenge on making this film was the fact that um, can it be interesting to anyone else besides me? You know, like I think that my own story is a quite interesting and singular story. When you think about the 60s, when you think about, you know, colonial histories, wars of independence and emancipation. So I think there was something about the encounter of my parents, which is quite, you know, a singular and potent story to tell. But I think the biggest challenge for me was how to go beyond that, you know, how to make that, is that story, the question was, is that story relevant to anyone else besides myself? And and the, the way I answer that question is yes, uh -huh. because I do think that through the story, so it is the, through the story of my parents and the meeting, um, and their separation and um, what entailed that um, is really a micro history that talks about, um, you know, the consequences of colonialism, of colonial violence, of tradition. Yes. Um, so I think um, ultimately for me, it became the biggest challenge was and I'm very happy to be able to share this film with an audience in festivals or in theaters or in other mediums, just because I think it is ultimately a story about liberation. It's all about emancipation, a story about, as you say in the question, um, the 1960s and how the 1960s and 70s, without romanticizing them, was a huge hiatus in history. It was There was so much hope um, in those two decades and in those years and I think the film looks at that it looks at how that very rich moment where everything seemed possible is exactly the moment that my parents met um, there was a certain feeling of utopia I don't know if utopia but of a possible different future within capitalism um, you know so I think that ultimately this is what I'm interested in I was interested in talking about when I was making this film and um, by telling my story or telling the story of my parents or by telling the story of Algeria. But ultimately, what I was really, you know, aiming at is, for example, mm -hmm. to unveil to a public that does not know the history of Algeria, that this is the history of that country, how those histories are crossed, you know, how the history of the South are crossed um, in the sense of, you know, Latin America and Africa in the 1960s. So, and also a, f a huge fascination, you know, in a moment where we live such a dystopic kind of moment in the world, not only because of the pandemic, because of politics. And when I look at what's happening precisely in Brazil and Algeria now, it's quite sad, you know, and it's quite, um, it's quite depressing, really. And so I think by sort of unveiling or unearthing or, you know, telling a story of a moment in history where where things seem radically different, where there seemed to be so much hope, it was important. It was important to do it now, I think, because this is a very complicated now that we're going through. And I think by looking at moments in the past where these things were dreamed of, that they were possible, where a radically different world was imagined, it was very important. And I think this is ultimately, it is the reason I made this film at the end of the day, besides the fact of it being a very personal story that I've always wanted to tell and to share. But ultimately, I think that at the end of, of it all, I think it is very much about, you know, shedding light in a moment of history that I think needs to be revisited, celebrated, um, and not taken for granted. Thank you so much, Mr. Ainus, for being with us. It's a big privilege to come with your film. And I hope all the people, all our viewers, to have enjoyed this film. I think it's a very significant film for Brazilian cinema, even though that it goes beyond the Brazilian story and history. Thanks. Goodbye. Hasta luego. Bonnoiche.